What is up? What is going on, everybody? I am back with another Mariners video, and I've got a very special guest joining me today. I've got Ty Dane Gonzalez from Locked On Mariners here with me. Um, if you guys aren't already subbed to Locked On Mariners, please go ahead and do that. They're probably the, at least in my opinion, the gold standard uh, for Mariners content on YouTube. Um, I've been subscribed to them for a while. I'm assuming if you're subscribed to me, you're probably already subscribed to them. But if you're not, head over there. And Ty, thank you so much for joining me, man. I truly, truly appreciate it. Very kind of you to come on and, and help my channel out. So thank you very much. Yeah, thanks so much for having me on. I really appreciate the invite. Always love talking ball. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. Anytime. So we're just going to go over a few Mariners topics here. Um, I've got a handful of questions for Ty. So remember to hit that like button, subscribe, and don't forget to comment your thoughts on all of this as well. So certainly an eventful 2023 for the Seattle Mariners. Um, after a really fun 2022, there were some bright spots, some down spots, and some controversy so far this offseason, to say the least. Mm. Um, so we're going to start off with something just more recent. Teoscar Hernandez didn't get the qualifying offer from the Mariners. Um, as usual, you're on, you know, on Twitter, you see everybody up in arms about it. And Ty, you were kind of the first person I saw that made the point. I was thinking that I I'm not convinced Teo wouldn't have taken that qualifying offer. I saw everybody kind of going, oh, this is stupid. The Mariners should have done it. They would have gotten the draft pick. And I'm sitting there thinking like, I, I don't know if he would have turned it down, to be honest. I don't really want Teo back next year. And you were kind of the first person that mentioned that. So just kind of your thoughts on the uh, qualifying offer with Teo. Right. So I think the first thing that we need to acknowledge here is like, yeah, it is a very bad market for hitters and free agency. So, you know, guys like Teoscar Hernandez will benefit from that, at least in, in theory. But in years past, we've seen guys get the qualifying offer and either they've had to wait a long time to eventually sign uh, especially if they're coming off of a down year like Teo is, where like they'll go into spring training or even beyond that point before they actually sign with a team. Uh, they'll also, you know, more often than not, see their earning potential in both years and, and dollars sometimes decrease because of having the qualifying offer attached to them. So for those that don't know how it works, essentially if, if a player has a qualifying offer attached to them, depending on what bracket you fall in as a team and that's dependent on where like how much you spend essentially if you're a luxury tax team or if you're a revenue sharing team which the mariners are that's the category they fall in if you're um, you know a luxury tax team you you would pay a second round and a fifth round pick to sign a player with a qualifying offer if you're a revenue sharing team you pay a third round pick uh so that's a hefty penalty for some teams because look most teams nowadays are very risk averse they're very much about draft capital and resources and resource allocation all that and so that does factor into some of these decisions so with tay oscar in particular you know look if he wants to go reestablish his market on a one-year deal the best place to do that is not seattle right we've seen the home road splits we we know that he really struggled in seattle so I'm not saying that it's a high likelihood that he would see, you know, one year, $20 million from Seattle and be like, eh, yeah, all right, fine. I'll just do it. Let's, let's reestablish my market here. Uh, but I do think that it gets to a, a certain point where it's like, all right, well, it's $20 million, right? Like, you know, sometimes you just got to go where the money is and, and bet on yourself a little bit here. So I, I think it's probably like a 5% chance that he would have taken it. But if it got to a point where, you know, teams aren't really lining out of the door if he has that qualifying offer attached to him to sign him and give up the draft capital and sign him to, you know, a three-year or two-year deal. Um, you know, maybe it makes the most sense for him to actually just take the qualifying offer at that point. Again, that's a very specific uh, circumstance, but if the Mariners even had a slight indication that he would do that, I don't think the risk of it, because look, we have to live in reality here. John Stanton is probably going to financially restrict Jerry Depoto and Justin Hollander to some degree this offseason. $20 million is a lot, especially for a guy that has some concerning signs of decline in his game, like Teoscar Hernandez does. You already know as a bad defender out in a corner outfield spot, strikes out a lot, and that's something that you're trying to cut down on in general. He's done, He's not a great fit. Um, you know, I could see them trying to bring him back uh, and and trying to bet on, you know, 
hopefully this guy is more like you know the 2020 to 2022 tay oscar rather than the 2023 tay oscar and, I, and i'm sure there's other teams out there as well that feel that way uh, so maybe there's a chance that he comes back but overall i just i don't think it's a great fit and i don't think the, the essentially the glorified third round pick that you would get for him if he signed a 50 plus million dollar deal with a team is worth that risk of having yourself handcuffed to him for a year and having his presence on your payroll restrict you from getting better getting better elsewhere so overall you know like i understand the the issues that fans have with it i'm not going to say that you're wrong i don't think that there's necessarily a, a wrong answer here uh but i i, I just for me personally uh, I, I feel that they made the right decision in, in doing that. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see what they do the rest of the offseason. I, I think when we look back on it, I, I think context is going to be very important when we look back on this on this decision. And hopefully they do enough this offseason where this is a very, very distant memory. That's kind of my thought, too. I think once we get into the trenches of everything, we're going to kind of forget about it. When there's such little news going on, every little thing, like the Penn Murphy situation for me, I'm kind of right. like, he's not going to pitch next year. Like, I get it. I like Penn Murphy. Yeah. They tried to sneak him through waivers. It happens. And I think he, yeah. your point is so spot on about Teo. And what I like what you talked about it versus some other people is it's not just black and white. It's gray. There's a lot of nuance right. to it. It's not just Jerry stupid. Didn't give Teo qualifying offer. Like you said, they right. probably talked to him about it ahead of time. They probably had some idea and I'm with you. I don't think he would have taken it, but I don't think it's just zero. No chance. Yeah. I do think there is a scenario where yeah. it's $20 million. <laughs> like, yeah. 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 I think, it, I think it's irresponsible to to say that it's just a flat out zero chance. And look, I know that he is, yeah. you know, he's like some tweets on Twitter that would indicate that he's not interested in coming back. And he basically said goodbye on, I think Instagram yeah. or something like that a while ago. Yeah. I get all that. But again, at a certain point, like if his market doesn't develop the way that he wants $20 million for one year probably makes the most sense for him. It, it, again, it's probably like a two to 5% chance, but yeah. still that's not zero. Yeah, exactly. And and I think he fit in with the vibes. I don't think he had any issue. There was no Jesse right. Winker situation here where mm -hmm. there was some, you know, work ethic issues or anything like that. So no, I, I'm with you hundred percent on that and, and spot on. So moving on to the next topic, and I'm going to go back a little bit here. But again, no sightings or anything to talk about. Maybe while we do the video, that seems to happen a lot. So, um, But the 54% comment from Jerry in the press conferences, and I watched your takes on it. And again, I think we're pretty much the same on it. Like, obviously, it was a, a very tone deaf comment to ask yeah. the fans, you know, hey, we're actually doing you a favor. I, I yeah. think on the whole, I, I get what he's talking about with the 54% and yeah. talking about that sustained success. And if you can do that, more likely than not, you will eventually find yourself in a World Series. Just wanted to get your thoughts a little bit on that press conference and that and that 54% comment a little bit. Yeah, so in a vacuum, like saying that you want to win at a sustained level over the course of, you know, 10 plus years is is great. I would I would love that. Yeah, absolutely. 100%. I would love to win a lot of baseball games over the course of a decade. Uh, I would love to always be, you know, good and right in the mix of things. Uh, but yeah, saying it after the way that the month of September went and then the way that he worded it and you know, this is the issue with with Jerry in general being so transparent over the course of his tenure in Seattle is that he just gets on a roll and he starts talking about baseball theory and all this stuff that the average fan, they don't care about. And that's not to blame the average fan. I'm not saying like, Oh, you're just too stupid to get it. And all right. that stuff, which Jerry kind of said that a little bit on Seven Ten when he, <laughs> yeah. uh, when he, uh, when he apologized, apologized which I didn't, yeah. yeah which I, I didn't think that was great either, but yeah, like it's just, it's, it's tone deaf, right? He's not reading the room properly in, in that scenario. And I think he does recognize that at the end of the day, but, uh, but that's just who you know Jerry is, right? Um, and you know, there's there's the good and bad that comes of it. Like for me, like for me as an absolute freak with this stuff, I love this stuff. I love roster <laughs> yeah. building and all that stuff. Like I like cool. Like I get what you're saying, but also like you know, I dragged him because I'm like, dude, what are you doing? This makes yeah. no. Why are you saying this right now? And also, I think like the the 54 comment is. 
a little bit flawed still because he said it's it's particularly in the the specific wording that he used where teams that have won 54 percent of the time over the last decade always make the playoffs it's not necessarily true uh because the teams that have won 54 percent over the last decade um cardinals yankees some of those teams haven't made the playoffs in some years over the last decade so that doesn't make sense from that perspective and if we're talking about you know just in single seasons if you win 54 percent of the time i mean they just won 54 percent of the time and they were on their couch watching the playoffs so uh yeah so he needed to word it a little bit better as well uh but yeah just overall really really tone deaf stuff um but again like with the teo stuff Hopefully they do enough this off season where it just kind of becomes like this distant memory. It, it's been, you know, yeah. a fun joke that a lot of people on Twitter have run into the ground, but you know, yes, very much. It's, it's gotten overkill now. It's yeah. And it's one no, of no one runs. Like, a, yeah. No one runs a joke into the ground better than Mariners Twitter. <laughs> no, Seahawks Twitter is not far behind either. But. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but, but you know, it is, it, it, and it's a great point. It's just like with tail. Like I, I said in my video talking about it. And another point I made was like, Listen, you're up there talking for two, three hours. You're probably going to put your foot in your mouth at some point. If yeah. I had to talk for three hours straight, I'd probably say something stupid too about the Mariners or about something. So, and then, like you said, if you go out and win next year, nobody's going to care about that comment. And if you lose, then your job might be in jeopardy. It's not going to be because of the comment. It's because you didn't win in 2024. So it's just one of those things that when there's no news, it gets brought up, but, but I'm yeah. with you, uh, you know, a hundred percent on that. So, uh, once again, everybody, thank you for watching. I'm here with Ty Dan Gonzalez from Locked On Mariners. If you're not subscribed to Locked On Mariners, please go over and do so. Ty and Colby really do a great job. And it's not just your hot take over the top. It is legitimate breakdowns of the Mariners and, and honest takes. So go ahead. And if you're not subscribed yet, please do. Um, next thing I want to talk about a little bit is uh, Texas and Houston. So and again, I shouldn't just go on Twitter for all the info because it's kind of a cesspool sometimes. <laughs> sometimes, um, But you hear a lot of comments from people and it's, oh, Seattle is, they're not close to Texas and Houston and, and you know, all this. And even if Seattle would have gotten in, they wouldn't have done what Texas did. And I, I'm just not convinced that the mayors are that far behind these teams. They finished a game behind them. They were ahead of Texas with like two weeks to go in the season. And I do think if the Mariners got in the playoffs with Kirby, Castillo, and Gilbert, it's not crazy. They could have gone on a run and and, and yeah. done something in the playoffs. Yeah. They have the best rotation in, in the division. Uh, even without Paul Seawall, they have probably the best bullpen in the division. Um, they just have to score more runs. That's really what it ultimately comes down to. I mean, the, the Rangers were kind of like the anti playoff team, right? Where mo you know, in most years pitching reigns supreme. And right. then the Rangers went into the playoffs and they just scored a ton of runs. And I mean, their pitching was a lot better than it was over the course of the second half, but it still wasn't great at times. Like their bullpen wasn't fantastic at times. Right. Um, but uh, yeah, the, the Mariners are are right there. I mean, if you are going to compete against a team like the Rangers with that kind of offense, you need a pitching staff like the Mariners. And fortunately, you know, they do, they yeah. have that. So yeah. that for me, look, it would be amazing if they, you know, traded for Juan Soto, depending on cost. Or if they sign Shohei Otani, whatever. I don't necessarily think, and this is a comment that I've made on my show that has gotten me in a lot of crap with the listeners because, you know, all that, because people have very high expectations for what this team yep. should do in the, in the offseason, naturally. And I totally get that. But while I would love all of those things to happen, I don't necessarily think that you need to add to your core offensively. I think you just need to beef up your supporting cast, right? Because you have a really strong core and Julio yeah. and JP and Cal it's just beyond those guys who's that other guy that's going to step up who are the couple other guys that are going to step up and again I I think like if you went out and you know you you got a three-win player to essentially replace Teoscar Hernandez like if you traded for Randy or Rosarena I mean that would be amazing yeah. Yeah. right and like I don't consider Randy like a star like he's a very good player, but he's not a right. star, right? Uh, contrary to like what the overall narrative is around him yeah. because of what he's done in the playoffs. Like if you look at his numbers, he's a pretty good player, fringe all star yeah. basically. Um, but like if you get someone like that, and then just you know add a couple of two win players on the back end, and and for me, preferably yeah. you push like Josh Rojas into like the Dylan Moore role yeah. instead of having him start. 
Like that's great. Like if you're able to do that, really cool off season, really good off season. So yeah, I think you really just need to beef up that back end of the lineup. And I think you're good to go. Yeah. I, I think you're really good to go. And if you use Miller to go out and get someone, which is probably what you would have to do if you're going to get someone like Randy or Rosarena or, you know, Lars Newbar or Nolan Gorman or whoever, uh, then, you know, you sh- should be willing to go out and spend money in, in free agency on a starting pitcher because that's where, I mean, free agency is bad overall because of the hitting market, but the pitching market in free agency is actually really good. So if yeah. you can go spend some money on pitching and then trade from your pitching depth to go get the bats you need, I, I think you're in a good spot. So, yeah, I, I don't think that they're far off from the Rangers or the Astros because while the Rangers and the Astros are better offensively, the Mariners are significantly better in the pitching department. And so uh, that's ultimately the name of the game, at least in years past, not particularly this year, but yeah, overall, I think they're in a good spot, and I mean, they only finished two wins behind these guys. Like, yeah. They were right there on the doorstep. Uh, doorstep, and look, I mean, if they won, you know, a couple more games, maybe the Rangers yeah. are not even in the playoffs, right? Let alone it, it, the World it, Series it, champs. It, that's the thing, too. Like I even pointed to, I got kind of ripped for in a video because it, it, it I, I pretty much said the Mariners were unlucky this year too. They were bad in one-run games, and they didn't have to be what they were in 21 or 22, but if they would have yeah. been 500 in extra innings in one-run games, I don't want to just simplify it and say, oh, do nothing this offseason, just win more one-run games, and you're fine. But even there, yeah. like a, a little, I mean, I can point to two or three games, and every team can do this, but I mean, that Reds game, something like that, win that game, and then that yeah. final game of the season, like you said, you may have been in over Texas, and I think people forget because the run Texas went on, the Mariners were not that far behind them. And like you said, they've got yeah. the pitching staff. And I think they have a core offensively that you need to build around. You made a great point. You know, if you can get a three-win player, Teo, I think, was worth 1.8 for F4 last year, yeah. uh, wins above replacement level. You go out and get someone that's three for right field, easier said than done. I mean, I'm simplifying it, but there's your one win right there that could possibly put you right. over. And I mean, you know. I mean, dude, if, if you lift the ball with bases loaded <laughs> against the Angels and Nationals, yeah. I mean, oh the Rangers might not be <laughs> yeah. World Series champs. Like, th- that's yeah. like, the, when you really think about it, the Mariners had a massive impact on the playoffs, with, whether it be like the Paul Seawald trade. Seawald was a big part of the Diamondbacks run. And then just the impact that, you know, they had on the Astros and Rangers getting in. Uh, so it's, it's incredibly frustrating. But it also, I, I think, if you want to take a positive spin on it, which is incredibly hard to do, especially if we're Mariners fans, but if you want to take a positive spin on it, it's like you were that close. You were that yeah. close to completely changing things. And, you know, I don't think that considering the way that they were pitching towards the end there where the pitching started to break down, Luis wasn't Luis and the bullpen was definitely an arm short after they traded Seawald. Right. Um, I don't know if they would have gone on, on a run to the World Series had they gotten in over the Rangers or over the Astros or whoever. But I think it would have changed the course of how that uh, how that postseason went. So, but yeah, they uh, they're close. They're they're really close, and yeah. they, they just need to have a a good solid off season. They don't need to absolutely kill it. They don't need to go out and get Otani. It'd be amazing if they did. Yeah, yeah, like, I'm all for it. <laughs> what what to say that like absolutely go get Shohei Otani. Right. Totally do that. But they don't need to do that in order for them to build what I believe is World Series contending club. Exactly. I'm on the same page. I, this is go get Shohei, go get Blake Snow. I'm all for that. Bring those yeah. guys in. That would be amazing. Yeah. But I'm with you. I don't think if they don't get those guys that they're necessarily out of it. And you brought up the Nationals and the Angels games and all oh, you know, and not to go on a tangent on those two games, but what was so frustrating too, it's not like those teams brought in some stud closer reliever that, you know, like a Felix Bautista that comes in, there's nothing you can do. He's just yeah. better. It was random. It was like Aaron Loop. That got out of that base. Yeah, it <laughs> was Aaron Loop. It was Aaron Loop. Yeah. <laughs> Just a fly ball. But anyways, yeah. Um, you know, digress on that. So I, well, and that's why they want to add more contact to the lineup. It makes right? sense. I, yeah. Yeah, because that's all you needed. There was to make contact. Yeah. <laughs> it was a, the ball a in the double air. a double play. Like a little <laughs> bouncer dribble or double play would have probably gotten them in the playoffs. So no, I agree with you. And on that topic, I I um you know, you mentioned the Paul Seawall trade. I guess I got to bring it up just because yeah. it, it's been, it, it's been, it's probably been more controversial than it should be because the Mariners didn't get in, the D backs did. And it looks, my take on the Paul Seawall trade, I, I love the trade. I actually think it was a really good trade. Um, the Mariners got more F4 out of Josh Rojas and the D backs got out of Paul Seawall. Now, 
Mm-hmm. There's more to it. I, I do believe in clubhouse chemistry and stuff, but the Mariners went 21 and five after they traded Paul Seawald. So if the clubhouse hated it so much, it didn't really affect them on the field. And I, I think it's an easy target of a trade to point at and be like, oh, see, they traded Seawald. They didn't get in. Um, now, I wish they would have offset that trade a little bit and maybe gotten a back-end starter to help with Wu and Miller, maybe added another reliever like they did with Joe Smith in 2021. Uh, but your thoughts on it? Because I, I don't think that's why they missed the playoffs was that trade. Yeah, no, th- that's old, what you said there about like mm-hmm. supplementing after the trade. That's what the issue is with the deadline. It's not that they traded Paul Seawald. <laughs> like, that's right. what ultimately gets misconstrued here when we have these discussions about the deadline, when we relitigate the deadline is that it's never it was never about trading paul seawald never what they got for paul seawald great valuation for a year and a half of a top 15 top 20 reliever in baseball great like josh rojas dominic canzone ryan bliss that's a great haul for the mayors the problem is they didn't do anything after that (laughs) like they didn't you know this was very similar to trading kendall graveman to the to the astros Mm -hmm they needed to go out and get their Diego Castillo and they didn't. Yeah. Right. And there was also a couple other things that they could have done. They could have gone out and gotten a veteran bat like Tommy Pham or Mark Canna, um, which those two guys did not really go for anything. And look, I know beauty is in the eye of the boulder and all that stuff, but look, they, they didn't really go for much. And they, they could have even picked up like Randall Grinchick off waivers would have been a nice little right. tomb. They had two opportunities to, a- to do that. Yeah. Yeah, that that one kind of blew me away because it's free. I mean, I, it's never free with John Stanton, but you know it. That so yeah, right. and that's kind of thing. And I and I know some of the like. Listen, I I mentioned Rich Hill a few times on my show, and I got laughed at a little bit. It was more of like, hey, a guy that can be a six starter to take a little bit off Wu and Miller. I will say this: the starting pitching market was crazy at the deadline. I mean, I think Rich Hill even got a legitimate prospect back at the deadline yeah. from um, San Diego. So I get it, and they were five games back at the time so i do get it but yeah it's just there was no supplementing they did a better job in 2021 supplementing the graveman deal they just didn't do it this year so you know that was kind of i think the frustration um, right and while it didn't have a and while it didn't have a negative impact on them in august obviously um it did in september right bullpen started to break down you know matt brash has thrown a lot of innings Justin Topa's has thrown a lot of innings munoz is you know, battling his his slider. Uh, there was a lot going on there. They they needed one more arm in that bullpen. They didn't need like a an amazing arm, but they needed a solid you know seventh inning guy to to help supplement that a little bit more. And and yeah, they needed. I mean, look, hindsight is twenty twenty. But I feel like even you know going into the month of August, you should have recognized like, hey, like Brian Wu's prob is on track to throw way more innings than he ever has in his. And his entire baseball career, not just professionally. Uh, you know, there's a good chance, especially after he's, you know, so, you know, not so far removed from Tommy John surgery that he might start breaking down a little bit here. And then just relying on Emerson Hancock, who has dealt with dealt with injury issues of his own, and he's another rookie, you know, and he didn't really look that spectacular in his few starts that he had. It just I was told that they were looking at veteran starting pitching. Yeah. Uh that they were, you know, involved in, in those discussions, but they just they didn't pull the trigger for one. Yeah. Oh, you're I can't hear you. I don't know if your mic. Well, Ty we is good? working. Are we good? Yep, you're perfect. Yeah. Yep, perfect. Okay. And you yeah. know, and yeah, to that point too, and, and you probably have more knowledge than I do on it, but I, I live in Arizona. I was listening to uh, Mike Hayes and the G-back, G-back, D-backs GM, and he was saying the same thing because th- their thing was starting pitching along with bullpen. And he was like, we tried. The, the market was just ridiculous for what people were asking for starting pitching. But even Verlander, I mean, Verlander went for a haul and Verlander's not the same Verlander he was, you know, a few years ago. Even the Rangers, and I'm not... Yeah, that they won the World Series, but even a role as Chapman cost them Cole Reagan's, right? Was that the Chapman right. trade or was that? Yeah, yeah I mean, he's yeah. looks lights out for Kansas City. So it was, and I get being five games back where they were, but I, I'm with you. It, you needed something a little more than Luke Weaver to be your next option when right. someone went down. Relying on another rookie and Emerson Hancock is just kind of tough. I, I'll, I'll say this, it kind of would have been nice to have a healthy Marco Gonzalez. I think that actually would have 
helped a little bit in September. I don't know if that gets him in because I think Wu and Miller are more talented than Marco. But just having a six starter would have been nice, a legitimate one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they absolutely needed uh, more depth on that front. I felt, and uh, and again, more depth than the uh, in the bullpen, and preferably a uh, you know a veteran bat instead of you know hoping and praying to God that Dominic Canzone is is something for you, which he was a little bit there, but for the most part, you know, I think he finished with like a seventy or eighty WRC plus in yeah. his time with the Mariners. So uh, Rojas was good, yeah. you know, uh, but uh, yeah, they they just didn't get enough uh, from the deadline. Um, real quick on that, I'll add one more thing. I, you know, I've talked about a lot. I think the Robbie Ray injury was a lot. Yeah. I mean, obviously it was brutal, but I think a lot of people really underestimate Robbie Ray because of the playoffs last year and yeah. this notion that Robbie's just not that good. And listen, I don't think he's going to win the Cy Young again. I don't think they were expecting him to. I think they brought him no. in to be, you know, a, a top of the rotation guy, not necessarily an ace. And I think a healthy Robbie Ray, they probably get in the playoffs. I think they win a couple of those games down the stretch with Robbie Ray in there. 100%. 100%. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there's this misconception that like Robbie Ray is like a top 10 pitcher in baseball Like when they signed yeah. it. Like, he had a very unorthodox Cy Young year in general, mm-hmm. right? Like His numbers, it's kind of like Blake Snell this year, right? Blake Snell mm-hmm. walked a lot of dudes and he's in the Cy yeah. Young conversation. Um, it's just, it's not like in most years, those numbers are not going to win you a Cy Young. Right. And the contract kind of reflected that too, right? It's like $23 yeah. million dollars a year. That's not that's not an elite contract for a pitcher. Like it's, right. you know, they, they spent money on him and that's really cool that they spent money on him. Yeah. But yeah. that's not like, they weren't paying for an ace necessarily. Yeah. He was the ace of the rotation. But when we're talking about true aces in baseball, there's yeah. like five or six of those guys. Like Robbie exactly. Ray is not one of those dudes, and so yeah, it's it's a little unfair to expect him to be that guy. He's a he's a solid, you know, number two, which is really yep. good, which is really good. It, like that, that's great to have in your rotation, and that's what he mostly pitched as over the course of 2022. And look, yeah, did he blow it in the playoffs? One hundred and ten percent. It was terrible. It was really bad. <laughs> I was I was there in Toronto when all the fans oh. were chanting Robbie, awesome. Robbie. It was awful. I was in hell. Uh, you got the last laugh though. <laughs> he, yeah, yeah. The the Mariners got the last laugh, and then in you know in Houston, look, he had not pitched out of the bullpen at all. <laughs> and then you ask yeah. him like, here, go throw to Jordan Alvarez. <laughs> In the, well, that, and possibly the biggest game of your life, right? Yeah. Like, well, and, and that's the thing too. Like, I, I don't want to go back to 2022, but I'm going to go back to 2022. Like, yeah. the issue there was allowing Jordan Alvarez to even bat. That there was no reason right. to get to that position. So this notion, oh, they should have kept Paul in. Well, Paul couldn't get Jeremy Payne out and didn't get. I forgot there was another like fourth outfielder that got a hit off of him or something. And I'm like, they never should have got Jordan Alvarez can hit a home run off anybody. It doesn't matter who you put. You could have gotten Castillo yeah. out of the bullpen there. He may have gone deep. There's just nothing you can do when yeah. you're facing a hitter like that. So, um, but yeah, I, I appreciate your takes on that. So last couple things to talk about here. Um, so some free agent targets. Um, obviously, I think, you know, Otani, Snell, sure. Give me, I, I haven't even talked about Otani in a video because it's like, yeah, give me Shoei Otani. I don't need to go over anything. Like, he's amazing. Would love him. Um, mm-hmm. But are there any targets you have that are maybe more, kind of second tier free agent guys that you you are looking at for this team yeah i mean when jerry talked at the gm meetings about um you know adding right-handed contact oriented bats my mind immediately went to lord as guriel jr doesn't strike out a ton he walks a bit puts the ball in play can hit you know for some over the wall power but that's not like solely his game which is kind of the case with teoscar hernandez yep. uh and he's a decent enough defender i, I want to say this real quick and this isn't something we're talking about a lot uh i feel um go get yourself a guy that, like that, that can play left field move jared over to right field jared profiles best in right field he's a great right True. field defender yeah. so i i want jared kelnick to be my right fielder next year personally and then just go get yourself a left fielder and you don't need that guy to be a particularly good defender like randy like randy rosa random but yeah lord is yeah. jr uh and look i said this last year and i'm gonna say it again this offseason i totally understand the strategy of wanting to rotate guys through the dh totally understand that and that would be my preference as well but if you don't have enough depth offensively to justify doing that don't do it 
go get yourself a full-time DH. So Jorge Soler would be great. His uh his data, his bat ball data profiles really well in T Mobile Park. So despite being a right handed, more so power oriented bat. Um so those are two guys that I'm kind of looking at. Uh and then again, you know, pitching, right? The the pitching market, that's the strength of the of free agency. And there's a lot of guys there, right? Like at the top end, there's Yamamoto, there's Aaron Nola, there's Blake Snell, there's Sonny Gray. I know that the Mariners have been infatuated with Sonny Gray for a while. For a while. I was told that they right before the lockout that they were having pretty intense discussions mm-hmm. with the Reds about acquiring Sonny Gray that mm-hmm. obviously didn't work out. He ended up getting traded to the Twins. Yep. They had talked to the to the Yankees, I believe, about Sonny Gray at a, uh, for a time, and I believe they had also talked to the uh, to the A's uh, when he was still there. Mm-hmm. So they've wanted him for a while. So wow. maybe that's something that they they look at there, and we you know, we know that Jerry and and Justin, but Jerry specifically loves to circle back on guys. Colton Wong is a prime example yeah. of that. Uh, another guy that I would look at in that same vein, Brandon Belt. Apparently, they were pretty close to signing Brandon Belt. Now there's a chance that he might retire, uh, but Again, full time DH, uh, but also he can play some first, so that's a bit of a hedge for Ty France because yeah. it seems like they're going to try one more year here with France. So if it doesn't pan out, at least you protect yourselves a little bit. They have to do that, by the way. They have to protect themselves. They can't get to another point where, you know, they're they're having to rely on getting something out of someone that they're not expecting, like Jose Caballero this year, right? Like, yeah. You can't do that. You can't build your roster like that. You can't build your roster where it's like Man, I really hope Cooper Hummel hits. You know, like you, you can't do that again. Uh, and the, you know, we can go on and on about Tommy LaStella and all that stuff. Really, my thing with last offseason was Dylan Moore got hurt. He had surgery on his core. He wasn't progressing that well. And they were just like, yeah, but he's going to come back and he's going to be fine. And it's like, mm, are you sure about that? Because he's going to miss all of spring training. And we saw what that did to Malik Smith a few years ago, not missing all of spring training. Like it completely derailed his season. And Demo for the first you know couple of weeks that he was up looked lost. He did not yeah. look like a major league quality hitter. So if things like that crop up during the offseason, right? If like say Josh Rojas has to have like some unexpected surgery or something like that, you can't just bake on him to come back and be the guy that he was during the second half right. of the season. You need to protect yourself. And you need to do that either via trade or, or through free agency. So uh yeah, again, um, you know, Belt, Guriel, Soler, those are some guys that I would look at offensively. Also Whit Merrifield, he's Mm-hmm. his batted ball data is rough like he it was is, like first yeah. percentile on average exit velocity which has never been part of his game really but it's 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 not very much in line with the Mariners philosophy like they like guys who hit the ball hard mm-hmm. uh, but he doesn't strike out uh he steals bases he can play multiple positions and of course they've tried to trade for him in the past yeah but the Royals of course asked for like Jerry Kelnick or yeah <laughs> Julio Rodriguez. Julio, yeah <laughs> yeah yeah so I, I think what the Mariners should do this offseason is ask for Bobby Wood Jr. and be like, hey, here's Jose Caballero. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. Well, you brought up a great point about the um, roving DH thing. And that's a point I've made um, is that I, I think their philosophy going into last year, because I got ripped on Twitter by some people in Mariners Twitter, because I said, I don't think Tommy LaStella was signed to be the DH. That was not their plan. I wasn't defending yeah the off season necessarily it was just dylan moore and taylor trammell were hurt and i think the goal was dylan moore kind of plays everywhere and okay he's in right field teo dhs tom murphy can catch cal dhs but murphy got off to a slow start dylan moore got hurt then came back slow and i think that was the plan not defending it but i don't think they said oh tommy Lestella, that's our da no it wasn't their plan it wasn't their plan it wasn't their plan uh you know like again uh they were pretty close on brandon belt i think that was at least one of their plans i don't know if that was plan a but that was one of their plans so if you're just kind of going down a tier list like obviously tommy lasella is pretty you know far below brandon belt even after the year that that belt was coming off of so yeah like in lasella like i was told uh by a source during uh spring training like scott service of the field staff think he's cooked like they think he's yeah. done like so there was clearly like some weird like riff there between the, yeah. the field staff and, and Jerry, you know, and Jerry came on our show and he was trying to sell the idea of Tommy LaStella to us. And it took everything in my core to not be like, what are you doing, man? Because even at the time, it was like he's coming off of three bad seasons. And Jerry even said himself he's coming off of two Achilles injuries, not one, but yeah. two Achilles injuries. 
<laughs> then he hurts his elbow in spring training and they're still forcing it and they force it for like a month or a month and a half right. sorry I, I know i, I no, said no, we you're all, fine. no you're we fine. could talk all we could talk forever and ever and ever about tommy solo but it yeah. irritates the living hell out of me <laughs> i mean at the end of the day he got like 20 at bats so it was it was definitely i think overblown in terms of his impact Endless, like Jerry's going to defend a player on the team. You know what I mean? Right. Because, like, like you said, it was Plan Z. So, uh, yeah. But right. I, I'm with you. It was just like it, it was so odd. You'd been better off just DHing. I mean, I don't who anybody else on the roster at that point. Right. Um, what's your thoughts right. on? I did a video on Justin Turner the other day. What's your thoughts on him as a DH? Again, another guy doesn't strike out a lot. Uh, yep. Savant Page is pretty solid. Now he's 39. That concerns me a little bit right-handed right. hitter in T-Mobile, but another guy gives you some first base insurance because, you know, another good point you made is you go back to last September and Scott was getting ripped for putting Ty France in the lineup every day. And I'm like, what right. else are you going to do? You're going to put yeah, Mike Ford at first thing. base? Like there wasn't much else they could do. You just have to hope Ty has one hot streak in him. So just, you know, thoughts on Turner. Do you have any on yeah yeah i do actually i really like justin turner i really like the possibility and i'm glad that you brought him up because i forgot to mention him and i would have mentioned him had i remembered him uh when you were asking me about free agent targets yeah i mean turner hasn't really shown any slides signs of slowing down now he you know hit in a hitter friendly ballpark in, in fenway uh this past year but yeah he's 39 years old but again he doesn't strike out he walks a fair amount you know so naturally he gets on base quite a bit uh, and he puts the ball in play and he can hit for some pop too, right? Like he can still put the ball right. over the wall. You know, is he going to hit, you know, 25 bombs? Probably not, but he's going to hit yeah. 15 to 20, you know, as a, uh, as a Mariner. Uh, so I, again, like, look, I, I, I get the whole idea of like, he's 39. He's, you know, towards the end of his career and you know, the whole thing, this, this whole you know season, when we were talking about the off season, you know, I get a lot of listeners and, Mariners fans in general saying like don't sign guys in their 30s and blah 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 blah, blah. And it's like all right sure like some guys yeah some guys do just fall off a cliff right. sometimes and uh, you know in their 30s and maybe that happens to Turner but again there's no real signs of that so if you sign him like the process of that is good to me like the process yeah. of that is very sound uh, and I totally get it and again like he's probably a full-time DH but if you don't have enough depth to justify rotating guys through the DH go you're yourself a full-time DH and you know, he could still probably shake it at third if you need him to play occasionally there. I think he played there like seven times this year. He played some second base yeah. uh, and played some first, right? So, again, that's also the hedge for Ty France. France doesn't get his crap together. So, um, yeah, so I really like the idea of Turner. Um, I also know that Joe Doyle has talked about him quite a bit. Joe Doyle from uh, mm. yep. uh, Future Stars uh, series. Uh, yep. He's um, talked to, uh, talked a lot about uh uh, Turner and uh, says that his batted ball profile really uh, or really profiles well in at T-Mobile Park yeah. as well. So I think he's a good fit. Yeah, and and, and he's a guy that's been to a World Series, so you get some clubhouse yeah. experience. You know, for people that are, I, I'm not huge on that, but I don't think it's nothing either that you get. Yeah, a guy if you like that stuff, that, like he's got all that too. He checks all those boxes. Yeah, exactly. Ex he checks should check everybody's boxes. So last question I've got for you, Ty, then I'll let you go. Um, there's been a couple small trade rumors. I don't know how serious they are, but we've heard a couple rumors mm. of Gino to Toronto, um, or at least it was discussed. I any thoughts on, on, on that one? Yeah. Uh, so I talked about this a little bit on Twitter and also on, on our show yesterday. Um, the Mariners are going to need something that makes it worth taking on the headache of having to find another third baseman in this market. And we've spent the last 40 minutes or so talking about how bad this hitting market is yep. in free agency. So there aren't many options. I'm not a big Matt Chapman guy, personally. Yeah, really good defender, but he had an 84 WRC plus from the month of May for it. And he's dealt with some hip issues and all that over the last few years. I'm I'm just not a big yeah. Matt Chapman guy. If you can get him, you know, it depends on cost with everything. Everything depends on cost, right? Um Outside of Chapman, though, like it's going to be hard to find a third baseman. And Josh Rojas, love Josh Rojas. Again, I would prefer him to be in that Dylan Moore role. Yeah. Uh, I would like to push him into more of a bench role where he's still getting 400 plus plate appearances, but it's not right. as a primary start. Um, yeah, Gino, it's just like there's definitely fair evaluation for uh, Gino in Toronto's farm system or Arizona's farm system or any of these teams that that need third base help, but that's not going to cut it for the mirrors at least i don't think i you know from 
I mean, they want to build out their major league roster, right? So I don't think subtracting yeah. from Gino for or subtracting Gino for the sake of getting a prospect haul is really it makes the most sense. I got you know some Blue Jays fans had some issues with something that I said on Twitter a couple of days ago where I was like, you know, maybe it's a contract swap for for George Springer. Yeah. I don't think they really yeah. had any issues with that. But um, I also mentioned Dalton Varsho taking a flyer on him. He's got yeah. three years left. He's was terrible uh, offensively this year, but yeah. still a really good defender. And I think there's still more there offensively. I, I think there's still a lot yeah. of upside there. So that would probably be, and maybe not even that, but that to me is probably what it would take for them to actually trade Gino. Like the point is a team is going to have to overpay for Gino. Gino is not coming yeah. off of a great year, but again, because of the lack of third base options in general, and the fact that the Mariners will have to go out and get another third baseman after that point yeah. means that they're, a team is going to have to overpay and that would probably in Toronto's case be like Dalton Varsho or something because again the Mariners are going to want major league pieces back or right. maybe it's you know Kevin Biggio and Jimmy Garcia or Kevin Biggio mm-hmm. and Eric Swanson someone like that yep. so yeah I, I don't well, that's that's all to say I don't think that Gino's getting traded I, I don't either like just for everything you said about the third base market and and I had mentioned the Springer thing it was I, I saw you'd mentioned that on Twitter yesterday and I'd mentioned it in a video yeah. You know, and I could see something like, listen, you know, your point about Matt Chapman. Listen, if you want to do a Suarez for Springer swap, so you got right. Springer in right field. Hey, go out and, and again, pipe dream, but you go sign Shohei Otani. You go sign Blake Snell. Then fine, you know, go get Jamer Condelario or Matt Chapman at third base. And I can deal with them hitting eighth yeah. in the lineup, you know, and, and live with that. But if it's just a swap, I think you're better off betting on Gino bouncing back a little bit. Um, I haven't yeah. looked at his batted bull batted ball profile too much but man i feel like gino was this close on like seven more home runs last year that just died yeah no he was he was pretty unlucky this year yeah he was absolutely unlucky this year um you know but the strikeouts he needs to cut those strikeouts out or look you can another common misconception right now in in the mariners fandom right is like you have to cut out all the strikeouts you cannot strike out no, you can strike out and you can strike out a lot. You can strike out 30% of the time, but you need to produce outside of that. You need yeah. to really, really, really produce and you need to put the ball over the wall or you need to be hitting for doubles. And like, you're not getting the power output that you need out of third base or first base right now. Yeah. So you need that to significantly improve. That was really like, if you look at the Mariners offensive woes last year, that's really like the, the main issue. I mean, they needed to be a bit deeper, but overall Ty France and, and, and uh, Gino Suarez is not producing the the power output that you need, and the fact that you're not really making up for that at another position that doesn't really produce a lot of power, like second base, that was the the primary issue for their offensive woes last year as a whole, like big picture. Well, and and that's a great point on the strikeouts too, because I've said that I, I'm not outs are outs at the end of the day. You know, right. yes, I get putting the ball in play, you can get a sack fly, you also grounded to double plays. So right. outs are outs for the most part. I get wanting to cut back on the strikeouts, but the yeah. issue was they didn't like Teo's kind of a good microcosm of that. He just didn't slug enough to outdo the strikeouts. Like Julio strikes out a lot. You know what I mean? Cal right. strikes out like, but they do enough to offset it. Um, and like you said, that they didn't get that, you know, you get 2022 Ty France and 2022 Gino, and, and this is all fine. This team's in the playoffs and, and we're not really complaining about it. And, like I said, I'm all for cutting down on the strikeouts. I, I like that idea of getting mm-hmm. some contact guys in there, but I don't think it's just, oh, the Mariners have a strikeout problem. That's why they didn't score. It's a little more nuanced uh, than yeah. that overall. 100%. Yeah, totally. Per- Perfect. So that's all I've got for you, Ty, man. I really, really appreciate you coming on, man. I had a blast doing this. So again, if you guys are not subscribed, well, subscribe to me for, well, no, subscribe to both of us, but um, if you're not. Subscribe, like subscribe to everyone. Yeah, yeah <laughs> just hit the subscribe button all around. Um, you Check Ty out on Locked On Mariners. Uh, him and Colby are on there. I think you guys are daily for the most part. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and it's really, to me, like one of the, per- just one of the premier Mariners um just content so in much. general it's just so of course Appreciate man so that. keep up the Appreciate great work that. keep up the great work and i'd love to do this again man during the season or yeah, something absolutely. as we get in the offices thank you man really appreciate it. so take care everybody have a great day thank you for watching and i will see you guys all next time peace